we come to roughly past 25 years of uh, <laughs> the liquid crystal development. Uh, one particular molecular shape has become extremely you know, important in this uh, era, and that's a rod with bent shape. And uh, such molecules were actually synthesized apparently in the 1930s by Forlander, but their liquid crystal properties were not uh, characterized. So let me just switch, you know, go to airplane mode. Uh, Neo Rieta from Tokyo Institute of Technology, they started synthesizing these and then studied in 1996 to find that it has a layered ordering like a smectic liquid crystal. And further, it had layer polarization, though the molecules are not chiral, unlike in the case of smectic C star liquid crystals. Now, uh, of course, you see all kinds of descriptions in papers. Bent core is uh, very popular. Banana shaped is even more popular. And uh, bow shaped and of course boomerang. All of them start with the letter B, so we have B type of liquid crystals. Now the Boulder group has done the most important experimental work in this area. In fact, and also in the area that I'm going to discuss next, they conducted very detailed uh, studies, you know, mainly freeze fracture electron microscopy and so on, to find that not only do they have polar packing, but the molecules are actually tilted. This the Japanese didn't recognize. And the Boulder group also immediately recognized you have tilted molecules with polar order in a layer. Then the layer becomes chiral because it loses all mirror plates. So even though the molecules are not chiral, the layer becomes chiral. And then the Japanese later found that, okay, in a given type of chiral layering, the molecules they adopt chiral conformations. So you have both types of conformations, so both types of layering, you know, left-handed as well as right-handed, with in equal proportion, because the average molecular shape is not chiral. And uh, once you have this, you have four possibilities. You see, as we discussed in the case of smectic C, you can have uh, synclinic tilting, tilting in the same direction, CS for synclinic tilting. Polarization is ferroelectric in successive layers. Then the chirality is the same, so it's homochiral, which means such a structure will have a helical arrangement. Similarly, you have anticlinic tilting, like the antiferroelectric liquid crystal we discussed yesterday. But then polarization is also antiferroelectric. In that case, again, it is homochiral, and again, it will have a helical arrangement. There are two other arrangements. So the clinicity is, you know, anticlinic, but polarization is ferroelectric. Here, the chirality changes sign from layer to layer. So on average, there is no chirality, so you can have uniform alignment. Similarly, smectic CSPA, where this is synclinic, uh, tilting, but anti-ferroelectric polar polarization. So this is again Russell. So these are the four possibilities. In fact, uh, many compounds, you know, now literally thousands of compounds have been synthesized. All the four types have been found. But the most prevalent one is the smectic CAP. And usually when they say smectic B, the B2 phase, Usually they refer to it, but not necessarily. There is some confusion. People use B2 for all these four phases generally. So, uh, you know, we had an excellent chemist amongst us. We were very fortunate to have one, Professor Sadasha, who is unfortunately no more. He started a very intensive synthetic work on this bent co molecules long ago. And he guided several students on this. One of the series that he found was this particular type of structure where X is CH3 and R is an alkyl chain. And as the chain length increased, you remember when we had rods, short chains have the pneumatic phase. The longer the chain, you go to the symmetric phase. 
phase. So the question is, do we get enigmatic phase? In this case, the opening, sorry, I should, uh, the opening angle, this is the opening angle, the bend angle is that. So this is what I mean by opening angle. The opening angle is around 120 degrees and these compounds do not exhibit the pneumatic phase, even in the case of lower homologs. Instead, see, starting with the fourth homolog, it shows what is known as V6, then it goes to what is called V1, finally V2 phase. V2 is the one that I just described. So what are these V2 and B1 and V6 phases? V6 is a two-dimensionally periodic structure. In fact, it is a columnar structure. It is liquid columns perpendicular to the plane of the screen. And then it's a rectangular uh, structure, you know, two-dimensionally periodic structure. And in each of these uh, columns, you have three or four of these bent co-molecules. So orient in that. Uh, question? Yes, please. Uh, these, the, these are not layered at all, right? This is, this is a... These are layered. These are, I, no, they're layered this way, is it? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that two-dimensionally ordered structure is the structure along any vertical slice like this? Or is yeah, it, this is, is the vertical slice of a columnar structure. I see. Okay, okay. So there is a columnar order perpendicular to the... And then the most more interesting thing is when the you know, chain length is extremely small. In fact, they found it is again a layer structure, but with a layer spacing roughly equal to half the molecular length. So the only way you can understand that is this kind of arrangement where there is some intercalation between successive layers so that you get half molecular layer spacing and these cannot be switched by an electric field, whereas this can be switched easily. These, some of them can be switched, some others not. So how do we understand this? So we sort of, you know, uh, uh, later on I will briefly mention about uh, the work done by Jacques Pro on what's called a frustrated spacing model for polar molecules. So we were uh, sort of inspired by that. We said here is a frustrated packing. So there are two extremes, both with uh, layering order. One is half molecular packing. This is full molecular packing. And uh, this is the frustrated structure in between when the chain length is in between. So the idea is there are two lamellar structures described by two density waves, psi1 and the corresponding wave vector. Psi2 is the other one, say the B2 phase. Psi2 is its amplitude and Q2, the corresponding wave vector. And then when you go to something which has both of these roughly uh, you know, in equal proportion, that is for the intermediate chain length, we can relate it to chain length and so on. I won't go to this gory details. Uh, 2005, I think it is an EPJ. So you do get that intermediate phase with two dimensionally periodic order. So this is a frustrated pack, packing stru structure with a frustrated packing. So this is the phase diagram that you get theoretically. So in fact, we did not consider the tilt because that would make the problem even more complicated. This is the B1, that's the B6. And we could only consider pneumatic phase and not the isotropic phase because we fix the order parameter, orientation order parameter to be equal to one. We didn't want to worry about that either. So if you take this metric CAPA, it is a chiral medium, it's homochiral, and you apply an electric field, then you see one of the layers will obviously reorient. The polarization wants to be along the field. But then this reorientation is about the layer normal. So smectic CAPA goes to smectic CSPF, which is again homochiral. The chirality does not change sign under the field. But this is not always true. Take this compound, for example. See, it has got two chlorine atoms close to this uh, oxygens of the ethyl I mean, and the uh, CO groups, the ester groups. So this makes this opening angle much long, much larger, about 140 degrees or so. A consequence of that is once you cool it from the isotropic phase, you first go to a smectic A, ordinary smectic A in which the molecules rotate freely 
about their long axis. It's a calamitic phase. That goes to asthmatic C phase, tilted molecules that's still rotating freely, which when you put it further goes to this metric CP phase, which is actually smetic uh, CPF phase. C is uh, of course homo, that is the tilting along the same direction, that is uh, uh, this kind of structure. Now the interesting thing again found by um, uh, the uh, Nakata et al. in the Boulder group, but the compound was synthesized I think in Germany. What they found was if you apply a small electric field, then the polarization revolves along the layer normal, just as in the previous case, chirality is maintained. But you apply a large field suddenly, then the molecules reorient by a rotation about the long axis. The chirality changes sign. I hope you get this. Do you? See, if it rotates about the layer normal, then the chirality is maintained. I discussed that in the previous slide. But if the molecules rotate about their own long axis, then this is positive chirality that is negative. So you can change chirality by an external electric. That's the me message here. So the question is, why does it happen? What the, uh, I think they developed a uh, theory. Their idea is that the viscosity for rotation around the long axis is much smaller than the viscosity for the rotation about the layer normal. But if you apply a small enough field, of course, the entire polarization is responding to that. So I think it, this is their argument. So it will reorient as a whole around the layer normal. But if you apply a large field, the molecule wants to reorient because each molecule carries a dipole moment and that wants to reorient. And its viscosity is smaller in any case compared to the viscosity of the entire layer reorientation. So they said the way it re, you know, changes the polarization state depends upon the magnitude of the electric field. Anyway, this was done sometime in 2006. Now, in some bent core molecules, again with uh, chlorine atom here, you actually go to the nematic phase from the isotropic phase directly. You see, this is one classic example. So we do get nematic phase, but only if the opening angle is quite large, 150 degrees or so, not with the 120 degree molecules. So physical properties of these nematic phases have been uh, studied. In fact, they are very unusual. I'll come to that in the next couple of slides. Lubensky, maybe it ends with an Y. I am sorry for the improper I. He suggested, you know, he developed a very detailed model of the nematic liquid crystals. There's a very long paper. That the third order invariant, Tijk, is also needed to describe the order in such uh, liquid crystals made of bent co molecules. And one of the structures he considered has this kind of arrangement, you know two molecules sitting like that. And he said such pairs of molecules can form what is called a tetratic phase, which will have a very small anisotropy, practically zero anisotropy, optical. So this was one of the things that he predicted. Of course, experimentally, the such pneumatic liquid crystals have been studied in great detail because people thought at one time that was even biaxial. Anyway, uh, I will not discuss that at all because it's known to be wrong. So a lot of work was done in uh, 2010 and so on about these uh, compounds. This pneumatic phase sort has some very unusual properties, very slow dynamics, rotation viscosity about 100 times that of typical pneumatics with rod-like molecules, very large flow by refringence in the isotropic phase, very a small angle X-ray diffraction exhibits short range layered order with tilted molecules. You know, you see these four, this is aligned along that direction. These four lobes show that you have what is called a skewed cybertractic structure with tilted molecules, but in a short group. It's not a lamellar phase, it's still a nematic phase. But there are groups 
in which there is a layering order with tilt. And then there is some other prop problem with uh, the cotton moton effect. And finally, uh, it was supposed that this uh, pneumatic phase will go through the critical point if uh, you heated it only about 0.2 degrees about the thematic isotropic transition point at under something like 30 Tesla. But what they found was even at 0.7 degree above the uh, pneumatic isotropic transition point under 31 Tesla, it was still a first order transition. So there are difficulties. Then uh, I started uh, getting interested in it. So then I looked at only the, you see what people had done after then was to look at the conformation of the entire molecule. It's uh, some chain and so on. That's horrible. You get literally thousands of conformations and you don't know what to look for. So I am uh, sort of, <laughs> I did a very much cheaper thing uh, with the help of uh, Pratibha and so on. We had some software, so I started sitting down and looking at the conformations of only the bent core. Then I realized that most of them have this larger bend, about 150 degrees or so. This is for the compound that I showed in the previous slide. But about 15 to 20 percent have various conformations which have got a much larger opening angle. So more rod-like, if you like. So the idea is if the moment of, in fact, there you can calculate the moment of inertia. So if it is more rod-like, they can come closer. So only such molecules which can come closer really form the cybotactic groups. That's the idea. Because you, you find that they are only cybotactic groups. It is not a lamella phase. Of the order of having something like a hundred molecules from, say, uh, the uh, flow induced birefringence in the isotropic phase, you know even in the isotropic phase, you have such groups. So then I argued that only such the excited state conformers form these layered structures with about 50 to 100 molecules. And I made some calculations of how many they should be. And then these, of course, can get orientationally ordered due to coupling with these ground state molecules, which anyway exhibit the usual pneumatic phase. And in the pneumatic phase, all of them rotate about their long axis free, more or less free. You see, these are words with some, you know, which are a pinch of salt, you must. So the Landau design free energy now depends on both the ground state molecules and the excited state clusters. And then there is the coupling between them which produces this part of, of the ground, the uh, clusters of the excited state molecules. So, and if you do the calculations, you can understand all the experimental results that I described earlier. So that's one of the things that I got into. Now, the next question was, Sadashi was synthesizing these compounds. So what do we do with them? People had already been studying, you know, especially the Boulder group had done a lot of work. So we had no chance of competing with them. So then we said, why not we mix two different types of molecules with two different shapes? In fact, this was an old thing. We had done such an experiment in 1985, mixing pneumatics made of rod-like and disc-like molecules. There were many theories which uh, predicted the biaxial pneumatic in that case, but what we found was that there is a coexistence of these two. Not, they did not mix at all. So, but bananas are different. They are just bent core rods. So, why not? This is the 12th homologue of one of the uh, homologous series made by Sadashiva. This compound was also synthesized by them, rod-like molecule. This is a commercially available 8-OCB, octyloxycyanobiphenyl compound. So we mix this both with that and with that. What we found, anyway, before uh, I discuss that, let me tell that we call this BO11. This forms a bilayer smectic A2 phase because the, this compound has no chain at this end. It has chain only at the other end. So this means that it forms a bilayer smectic phase. And this is the usual B2 
two phase with uh, you know uh, this uh, tilting in the same direction. So both of them show lamella phases. When we mix them, this is the B2 phase, this is the banana end. You keep adding the rods. First we get the B1 phase. You add more of those rods, you get then the BS, B6 phase. So, so this is like decreasing the chain length in a homologous series. And then we get something even more interesting. See, this is the end with the back, the bilayer smectic A. There's a small range of compositions in which that bilayer smectic A phase, which is uniaxial, when you cool it below some temperature, it becomes a biaxial smectic A phase. We didn't get biaxial nematic, but here we got a biaxial smectic A phase. This happens because, as I'll show in the next, uh, ah, maybe why do we get this B1 and B6 phases? This is mainly because these rods can sit in between these patches and act like glue to sort of uh, interact with the aromatic to aromatic, aliphatic to aliphatic, and so on. So you can understand these things at a molecular level reasonably well. Now, in the case of by the biaxial smectic A, the only way we could fit in was the following. The uh, bananas, the, you see, I think I discussed yesterday, aromatics want to be with the aromatic groups because that will increase the dispersion interaction energy. Aliphatic part of the molecule wants to be with the aliphatic part. So then in this bilayer, the bananas can only sit like this. Above some temperature, there is no orientational order within the layer of the bananas. Below some temperature, they get ordered as it is shown here. So you go to the biaxial smetic A phase. And in fact, we have done a lot of other studies which I have not discussed, except to say that we were interested to know whether, after all, there is a nematic above this also, whether it by chance shows biaxial nematic. And let me make one claim here. Hitherto, no biaxial nematic phase in thermotrophic liquid crystals have been found. You will find literally about 100 papers claiming that all of them are wrong. So <laughs> let me, <laughs> including in banana type of uh, molecules. Uh, anyway, I won't go into that. You see, we mix these two. So you form the nematic above some temperature. Then you measure the orientation order parameter. It varies as usual, increasing as you lower the temperature. Fine. But then you measure the bend elastic constant as well as the twist, uh, you know, splay elastic constant. The bend elastic constant, as I discussed yesterday, in the case of pure rate OCB, it has nematic to smetic AD transition. So this diverges. Allah, you know, this is what Dijain taught us, and this happens. But as I increase the banana molecule, this is molar, 11 molar, of course, bend elastic constant is very much smaller here, 4 compared to 45. That is because you have put a lot of bananas. 14 molar decreases further, but see what is happening. It is no longer increasing as I lower the temperature. 17 molar, it actually dips. In fact, as you lower the temperature, in spite of the fact that the order parameter is increasing, the bend elastic constant decreases as you lower the temperature. So why does it happen? The, in the mean field model, of course, uh, the uh, elastic constant should go as order parameter square. So it should have simply increased. For 8 OCB, we can assume, forgetting about the divergence, that it follows that. For a small mole fraction of CB, you know, where maximum thing was 17 mole fraction, you can always write, because of the bananas, the bend elastic constant wants to go down. So minus some coefficient into the molar percentage. Then the coupling between the bend distortion and the bend shape of the VC molecule should depend upon the orientation law. You can easily imagine that if there is not much orientation law, that coupling cannot be good. So I say then that uh, this alpha 3, should 
as it should be also be proportional to it. So if you put all this, you can actually get that maximum and then the uh, bend elastic constant going ground, going, uh, uh, you know, decreasing as you decrease the temperature. And subsequently, even in pure pneumatic phase exhibited by single component BC molecules, this K33 was found to in, de decrease as the temperature is lowered in some other cases. Jackley has written a nice review in 2013 on such phenomena, pneumatic liquefaction. Now, there are some cases where you have this uh, tilted molecules forming the B1 type of structure. If you apply an electric field, then it goes to a layered structure because uh, you know these are uh, actually anti-ferroelectric. They rotate because these are some special cases where they can respond to the electric field. And then instead of forming, having this two-dimensional periodicity, you go to the lamella phase. Then I come to a very interesting uh, liquid crystalline phase exhibited by these uh, banana-shaped molecules. They again appear to be layered at first sight, but fantastic textures under a polarizing microscope. See beautiful uh, you know, uh, spirals and all kinds of uh, checkerboard patterns, all kinds of things. And such compounds are synthesized both uh, in Germany and then by the Boulder Group and by Sadashiva. So all of them found these very beautiful patterns. And again, 2003, Boulder Group did a very detailed study and then they came up with this model. They said, it's actually not a one-dimensional periodicity only, it's a two-dimensional structure because within each layer, there's a splay distortion of the polarization. Because di p is an allowed distortion, because p is a vector, and di p is a scalar. And between these um, splay distorted stripes, there is some defect line. And in fact, they did, this is their uh, pre this fracture electron microscope, you can see that uh, there is an undulation of the lake as you go across the lake. And in fact, this is the picture that they give. These, I've taken all these figures from their uh, science paper in 2003. And they also found that the layer spacing itself becomes pretty long when there is this wall between these stripes with splay distortion. And they also found that in some of the cases, the so-called what I call B1 is what is now called B1 reverse because the molecules are tilted in this direction along the columnar axis. See, in the B1 phase that I showed, the bent molecules were orthogonal to the columnar axis. Their plane was orthogonal. But here, the bent core is oriented along the columnar axis. And they said even here, there should be a splay distortion within the column. And a detailed phenomenological theory of this phase was developed in which a strong coupling between molecular tilting and divergence of P was shown to be necessary for the formation of this modulated structure by uh, Wopotik et al. I think these are Slovenians, if I'm not mistaken. And this also means, in fact, there's a whole paper on this by that group, no tilting, no divergence of P modulation. That was the, that's the title of the paper, most probably. Unfortunately, 2012, again, Bowler Group, they make this compound. In fact, one of the people who was in, uh, involved in the synthesis is uh, Amarnath Reddy, who was trained by Sadashiva on such compounds. But anyways, she moved to them as a postdoc later. So he synthesized this. This exhibited a divergent dip modulated phase with upright molecules, metric A P F modulated. So, not that theory could not explain. So it's again you see free fracture electron microscopy shows the stripes. So what's happening here? So I suddenly remembered my two-state model. Said so maybe that explains this. The idea is again the following. The excited state molecules, which are uh, more rod-like, can rotate freely and form walls. They, jam, you know, they join together to reduce the rotational entropy, basically. 
And then in between the walls, of course, you have the ground state molecules, which are, which have bigger band, uh, smaller opening angle. They form this plate structure. And I also said probably they form in successive uh, stripes must have antiferroelectric so that you know, there is no other problem due to the, you know, you know ferroelectrics form domains and so on, antiferroelectric domains. So it was then how do we sort of explain this? It's a fairly straightforward thing, the usual Landau theory. Then the divergence has a, another term, you know, this alpha m squared is one constant, and then there is an m squared div m also allowed because it's only three m's involved here and you are going up to the fourth power in the Landau theory, so you cannot ignore that. Then, of course, there is an elastic cost for any such distortion. Then, when you have such a structure, the divergence of P inevitably has some charge charges. There are bound charges which form, and they have a positive interaction energy. So you pay that price. P m eta, unfortunately I put eta, should be P m x square. You see the component uh, which looks towards that interface. Divided by 2 epsilon naught E epsilon, where this epsilon is the one without the contribution from the polarization. That's another important thing. So if you do the calculation using this theory, you can explain practically everything. I won't go through this again. See, so basically, polarization that is measured in the uh, uh, striped phase is much lower than that measured in the uniform phase. In fact, there is a first order transit, very weak first order transition between these two because the order parameter M itself jumps. A very small jump, but nevertheless a jump. So it gives a very weak first order transition. And then the stripe width it itself increases as you approach the transition point. All this agreed very well with the experiment. But now, there was no tilt needed. So the question is, why do we need uh, the old theory even for the tilt at time? So, of course, I had a lot of difficulty with, I invariably the <laughs> journal sent it for referring to the original theories and they tried to decide. Anyway, uh, finally it was published. So tilt is not needed. For this. Even in the case of tilted molecules, the same theory applies. And in fact, they had not made this detailed calculation about temperature variation and so on, which I have done. Now there is another variant of the layer structure, which uh, the some bent core molecules also exhibit. See, in, up to now, the polarization is in the plane of the layer. Supposing the polarization itself get tilted with respect to that plane. The molecules are also tilted. This is what is called a general tilt. Such a structure has triclinic symmetry, the lowest symmetry possible in the, anything, including liquid crystal. And of course, it will be chiral natural. So this is what is called the smectic C G phase, G for general. Apparently, Dijen in his first book made a passing remark that maybe one should look for even such structures in rod-like molecules because that time we didn't know that bent curve molecules form liquid crystals. So now people have discovered a few of these smectic C G phases. And in fact, various possible arrangements, you see this will form usually bilayers. I come to that in the next slide. So various possible bilayer structures have been discussed by Brian, Darwin Roy, and so on in a couple of papers. In a few cases, such bilayer structures also form the modulated phase, like the B7. B7 is that modulated structure with filtered molecules, or smectic A, P, F modulated. Similarly, these are bilayer modulated structures. Uh, the French group has done a lot of work on this. This is a Bedell et al. Marcero uh, was the leader of that group. So my argument is, you see, you remember uh, the uh, reversal of polarization and application of a field. There are two modes. One is it can be through the rotation around the layer normal. That is what gives you the B7 phase. So my argument is in these very special cases, 
the divergence of p arises because of a rotation about the long molecular axis. Not rotation of the molecules about the long molecular axis, not by rotation about the layer normal. Layer normal gives you the V7, and this will necessarily involve a tilting of the polarization direction. And once the molecule is like this, it wants to form a bilayer, not a monolayer, because of dispersion interaction between these two. You know, you imagine a tilted molecule like this. So then this person favors this, such a structure. In fact, this can be shown when we did our work on spectic AAF. I think yesterday I referred to that. Uh, that was one of the contributory factors. So this naturally forms a bilayer. So I, I think this uh, a couple of years ago I published. Anyway, now in all these cases, the, there is a lower temperature phase, which is metric CSPF, paraelectric. As I said, there are many cases where it is metric CAPA or CSPA. Those do not exhibit the modulated phases because it's just not possible to fit in. You can figure it out geometrically, it's not possible. But many such cases show another unusual thing. They, as you cool from the isotropic phase, they have a smectic A structure, but with very unusual properties. You apply an electric field, it shows a polarization which depends upon the field. They call this the smectic APR phase, the randomly polarized layers. And in fact, Posicha et al. in 2003, they also found this phase. They developed a simple model. According to them, there are only two terms. One is PI dot PI plus one, the nearest neighbor interaction, which uh, I think with a negative sign gives ferroelectric ordering. And the square of that wants to orient it in the orthogonal direction because that is a positive sign, right? A dot PI1 squared average would like to be zero because of the positive coefficient. So they are orthogonal molecules. So then they said, Therefore, you can have some arbitrary orientation. They said three possibilities, but they are all of equal energy. And they said a combination of some helical arrangement and something with orthogonal molecules and so on will give this metric APR phase, which is polarization with random orientation. But then some detailed experiments were done using the second harmonic generation by the uh, Japanese group, Takezoe and so on, they said, this shows a Langevin process with a finite polar domain of the order of 100 molecules. The size increases as you lower the temperature. So that could not be explained by this. So back, you know, I, I, by then I had, I said, why not two-state two model again? <laughs> See. Supposing I now consider disks of that type and consider a plus one defect which is shifted out, the, okay. whose origin is shifted out, the, then this is the structure I get. Then as you go to lower temperature, anyway, this favors the antiferroelectric thing because these go to antiferroelectric B2 phase at lower temperature in any case. And this, if you calculate the interaction energy between such disks, electrostatic interaction energy is lower than KBT. I have shown this in this paper just last year. So this will be arbitrarily oriented in the absence of a field. You apply the field, this will reorient following that Langevin process. And so again, one can just understand the structure. So in my opinion, two-state model where there are two different types of conformations of the cores of the bent co-molecules is an essential aspect of most of these phases. This is possible only because of the bent core. See, bent angle can be varied. Not, is not possible for rods. Uh, and then, oh, I have, anyway, I have lost that. So there are other structures using bent co-molecules where uh, you know, I'll just briefly mention them. 
When the sample is cooled from the B2 phase with liquid layers, the layers develop a hexatic order. Yesterday I just mentioned to you what is hexatic order. What happens is this B2, the intralayer order has a, you know, sort of broad uh, X-ray diffraction pattern because it's a liquid layer. But as you cool to this thing, it becomes pretty sharp the interlay, that is because of the hexatic order. But on the other hand, very interestingly, the interlayer diffraction, which was pretty sharp in the V2 phase, that becomes broad. In fact, if you go to the lower temperature, this is the two phase coexistence range. If you go to the lower temperature, in fact, many uh, sharp reflections corresponding only to the intralayer order, but this is pretty broad. So this means, that the interlayer you know, packing has become sort of ill-defined. And not just that, if you take a sample between slide and cover slip, it is found to be highly chiral. You see optical activity, it shows huge optical activity. Between cross polarizers, it sort of shows uh, some, you know, it's not totally crossed out. But if I put the analyzer at along one direction, I'll decross it a bit, you see two domains with opposite chirality. You decross it with the opposite orientation of the analyzer, it reverses. So there are domains of opposite chirality, highly chiral structure. Again, Boulder group, and again back to freeze fracture electron microscopy. They are the experts in that. So they found, this was done in 2009, I think, it shows a helical filamentary structure, nanofilaments. So what has happened is the layers have broken up, form tapes, then they twist. It's a nanofilament. The width of that is of the order of four or five nanometers. The helical pitch is again of the order of a few nanometers. Highly chiral interactions between molecules which have now taken the chiral uh, you know, conformations appear to be capable of breaking it up. And this, I think they have, in fact, I'll come to the next slide uh, because there is an associated different structure also. They say this is, in fact, it is very clear that uh, there are helical filaments. These form uh, this B4 phase as it is called and chiral domains where similar chirality, you know, nanofilaments with similar chirality join together to form a domain. Of course, again, there are two opposite chiralities as I showed in the previous slide. And then there is uh, a very unusual thing. You can put this in something like 5CB, a liquid crystal made of rod-like molecules. The two do not mix. It is very different from what we found. We found that rods and bananas can mix to form new type of structures. Here, they just don't talk with each other. The nanofilaments simply grow, you know, independently, surrounded by the pneumatic phase of 5C, finished. And if you do a DSP, that is a differential scanning calorimetry, you'll find whenever a nanofilament grows, you see a peak. So they are totally phase separate. Yet another type of chiral structure was found around the same time by the same group when they were studying some of the compounds. And this is this uh, famous cubic structure, which you find in other types of, especially lyotropic liquid crystals. Again, highly chiral, one degree per rotation, one degree rotation per micrometer. And it's much more dark than the previous case between cross polarizers. So they called it dark conglomerates. Again, left-handed and right-handed in equal proportions. And uh, they have discussed this uh, in terms of the saddle play elasticity. You can see that there is negative curvature, the Gaussian curvature, because it's negative curvature here, and around that it's positive curvature. And in terms of a saddle play elastic term, and uh, you know there are lots of surfaces around in any case, so they say they can understand this. This is again done in 2009. This is also called 
before uh, phase by some people, but dark conglomerate is the name that is now accepted. And another interesting consequence of the low K2 tone, K33 values of BC is that you can enlarge the uh, blue phase range. So yesterday I showed you a sample where the range was only 0.3 degrees or so, BP1 and BP2. But merely by adding some 25 to 30 percent, mole percent of bent co molecules, the bent co molecules adopt chiral conformation and actually increase the range of BP phase. And people think there may be some uses for this, but anyway. So, a different type of molecule can show bent shape also. And this is uh, led to an, at another type of pneumatic liquid crystal. So I, I think I should describe this. This is, these are dimers, cyanobiphenyl at both sides, cyanobiphenyl, and there's an oxygen here, and then an alkyl chain in between, dimers. If N is even in number, the shape of the molecule is rod-like. If N is odd, the shape can be bent because this takes an all trans conformation usually. That's the favored conformation. And in fact, these such compounds are studied in early 1990s, and you find that the pneumatic isotropic transition point can be lower by about 100 degrees to the uh, homologs corresponding to this compared to the homologs corresponding to that conformation. But in, uh, uh, yeah. In 2011, about 11 or 12 years ago, a new type of pneumatic was found in such liquid crystal. This is CB7CB, which means seventh, the chain with seven carbon atoms, odd number. They found that this was, again, a chiral structure. Again, molecules are not chiral, but the structure was chiral. This was originally found by NMR by some work done by Lockhurst and so on in Britain. And uh, freeze fracture transmission electron microscopy clearly shows that there is a periodicity as in a cholesteric phase. This is, there is no density wave here. It's like the cholesterol. There is a periodic structure, but no density. And they then realized that back in 2001, Dozo had actually predicted. In fact, Subsequently, the um, Boulder group said that maybe uh, Robert Mayer had made this uh, observation in an early reviewed uh, paper back in the 80s or so, somewhere, that such a thing should be possible. The argument is very simple. See, Dozo realized that there are no bent core molecules where the bent elastic constant is very low. He asked himself, okay, what happens if the bent elastic constant becomes negative? Then for stability, you need a higher order. You see, of course, you cannot have, see, if, if you have bent structure, it will be just a, something like a sphere, or, you know, some closed surface. So he was asking the question, can I get something more extended a face? Then he predicted, this kind of structure. If you consider such a heliconic structure, you see, this is the, uh, the director is supposed to have this kind of uh, polar angles. And you assume phi is k. That is, there is a pitch, there is a helical twist with this wave vector along that axis. So then, in fact, he showed that if k3 is negative, this can be stable. And when theta naught is small, in fact, theta naught is small in most of these cases, you can just keep the terms only up to theta naught to the power four, then you can minimize the energy with respect to both theta naught and the wave vector, and you get that structure to be stabilized as long as K3 is less than zero, negative. So then people realized that what they had found here was exactly that, heliconic structure. So these are called twist bend pneumatic phases. And a lot of work has subsequently been done. And of course, 
people probably measured the elastic constant K33, which did go down, but it didn't quite go to zero or across zero. The reason is by the time the temperature was reduced to this, which is just about 0.1 degree above the transition point between the usual pneumatic and twist bend pneumatic, the twist bend pneumatic nanofilaments grow and they now act like rods and they increase the, the, those little rods increase the bend elastic constant. So it again starts going up and nobody has been able to measure the bend elastic constant in the NTP phase itself. So this is the sort of uh, picture that we have. Even therefore the simplest liquid crystal, namely pneumatic, which has the usual uniaxial d infinity at symmetry, in a macroscopic sample, it can have very different short range structural orders, giving rise to very unusual problems. Of course, the most recent development in the field of liquid crystals is also another type of pneumatic. And this has got polar symmetry, so ferroelectric pneumatic. So let me now, you say yesterday I didn't discuss this. The question that one always asks is what is the molecular origin of these phases? First paper was by Max Bond. I'm quite sure all of you are familiar with his name. Of his book on optics, all of us have used, and of course, his probabilistic you know, explanation of quantum mechanics is very well known. He developed the first molecular say, theory, saying that maybe these are due to dipole-dipole interactions forming a ferroelectric phase. He said pneumatic is a ferroelectric. But actually at that time, to 1916, there was no ferroelectric known in any medium. The ferroelectricity was discovered in crystals only in 1921. Later, in uh, I think one of these solids, maybe, I don't know, Rochelle salt or something. But I think I have described this yesterday. Subsequently, all experiments showed that N has a polar director. And even compounds like this, Pentaphenyl, which has absolutely no dipole moment, also forms pneumatic, etc. I have gone through this yesterday, so we'll uh, repeat that. But you know, once the display devices were invented and uh, liquid crystal displays became essential for uh, laptop uh, computers, uh, you know, cell phones, and so on they had to reduce the operating voltage. One way of reducing the operating voltage is to introduce highly dipolar groups. So this is how this pentyl cyanobiphenyl was initially synthesized by Gray, a well-known chemist from Britain, who also patented it. I am quite sure he has made a lot of money. So either the CN group or an NO2, NO2, they have roughly similar dipole moments of about 4.5 degrees. These were synthesized, a large number of those. But do they then form? In fact, if you calculate the dipole R interaction energy, it is a few times KBT. Do they form the ferroelectric pneumatic that Bond predicted? Unfortunately, no. The reason is, as we discussed in 1973, these rod-like molecules with such dipoles can only form anti-parallel pits, not parallel pits. It's very clear because the distance is small in this direction, the distance is large in that direction. So this is a much stronger interaction and this is only anti-parallel. And in fact, if you take 5CB, this is taken unfortunately with some red filter for some other purpose, you see even these molecules have these two brush defects, which means the director is apolar, even in this pneumatic phase made of such compounds, highly polar compounds. So if the chains are long enough, of course, uh, in fact, what uh, subsequently X-ray scattering studies made by Ledbetter showed that you have a short range order with what he called partial bilayer, a bilayer spacing which is about 1.4 times the molecular length and that arises because 
very strong interaction between these molecules, still the aromatic to aromatic dispersion interaction energy, now enhanced by this dipole-dipole interaction. So the chains are thrown apart and you form a layer, which is about 1.4 times the molecular length. The spacing is 1.4 times the molecular length. In fact, longer chain molecules actually show partial bilayer smectic A phase. These are called smectic AD phases. Subsequently, Claude has found that there are some cases in which the smectic AD phase, as you cool, goes to another nematicals. It's called a re-entrant nematicals. So you start with isotropic, go to nematic, go to smectic AD or cooling, and then you cool it further, you again get a nematic phase. And then the French group found the other compounds in which below the smectic AD, there is of course the re-entrant nematic. Below that, there is another smectic phase, a re-entrant smectic phase, but now with a layer spacing which is roughly equal to the molecular length, not the uh, you know 1.4 time molecular length layer spacing phase. So how do we understand this? Jacques Pro developed a very a phenomenological, it's a very well-known theory, the above sequence, coupling the two order parameters corresponding to the smectic AD and smectic A1 spacings, and there's a nice discussion in Dijain and Pro's revised book on physics of liquid crystal. Those of you interested, I, I think it's, it's a very nice discussion of this phenomenological model. But I am interested in the molecular arrangement. Why does this form at the molecular level? There were some theories which said, OK, the pairs break up. Therefore, individual molecules have anyway molecular length. But then they forgot that this molecular length, smectic A1 phase, is a low temperature phase, not a high temperature phase. So how do you explain or understand a monomolecular length at low temperatures? That was the problem. So my argument is the following. You see, we have already discussed this. But notice here, the chains are thrown apart. This dipole induces, these are highly polarizable aromatic cores, so that is, induces a dipole, but this dipole enhances the net dipole of the neighboring molecule. But supposing for fun, I consider two parallel molecules. Now the two chains come close. So there is a dispersion interaction energy which is favorable between these chains. Here, that doesn't happen. Of course, the dipoles repel. But then, this permanent dipole induces a dipole which is oriented opposite to that. So you reduce the net dipole moment of the molecule itself. So you lower the, you know, the repulsive interaction and enhance this attractive interaction. The dispersion interaction and this dipole dis induced dipole interactions both go, both go as one over r to the power of six. The dipole-dipole positive interaction, the repulsive interaction goes as one over r cubed. So that tells you why these monolayers form at low temperature. At lower temperatures, the density increases, the molecules come closer, and therefore one over r to the power of six wins over one over r to the power of three. And in fact, you can sit down and make calculation and this comes out right, you know, compared to KBT and so on. So we developed a theory based on this. This is Jyotsna Rajan and myself back in 1990. So there is an intermediate temperature range where both of these occur and they cannot form a layered system at all because there are two types of very different layering. That is when you get the re-entrant nematic. And as you cool down, the you know, larger number of molecules come closer. So then you can form a smectic phase with this layering on. So all this is known experiment. In some cases, there can even be a nematic nematic transition when the short range order jumps from having, you know, a ferroelectric type. This is now a ferroelectric type short range order. The nematic as a whole is still a polar in nature because neighboring groups can again, not molecular level, but group level antiferrotic. 
and when the short range order changes you can get a thematic thematic transition but because the order is still a polar in both cases it can only be a first order transition and in fact we did the calculations to show that such a thing is possible subsequently it was found in both some binary mixtures and we found it in a pure compound and there have been many theoretical and computer simulation studies looking now for the ferroelectric pneumatic of it because people thought why you know all this has happened so why not actually have a ferroelectric pneumatic there's been a lot of simulation and also many other types of theories most of them even look for such an order with spherical molecules with a central dipole moment what happens is they form chains see these dipoles can line up see that's an attra attractive interaction form chains and some simulations show that these chains which now look like rods can form a magnetic fields of course there is a nice review article uh, by bc et al in 2010 i think it's been pre that covers all the work done in this and then i uh, you know there was also a paper by peter palfrey mahara in 1988 where he said if you have disks with uh, dipoles perpendicular to the plane of the disk they can again form a ferroelectric pneumatic of course as i said discussed yesterday the only ferroelectric liquid crystals that were found in the last century were only made of layered systems smetic sea star or banana molecules towards the end of last century some polymers with about 30 monomers with longitudinal dipoles so these dipoles add up to a huge value now they were found to exhibit optical second harmonic second signal so the polar order provided they were cooled to the pneumatic phase under a large electric field cold that is how it the man who originally started this banana craze he uh, did this in 1997 just one year after his banana paper but these polymers have a very high rotational viscosity so nobody has been able to apply measure the polarization by reversing the field for example so we don't know whether it's a genuine for electric pneumatic or only because of the polling it remains put after polling in that state so that's not known and now we come to 2017 two molecules were synthesized this is by a british group this has this no2 again that has a large dipole moment this has got mainly fluorine atoms fluorine is electronegative and this has got three fluorine atoms which are substituted like this is done by a japanese group uh, head, led by uh, nishikawa at all and their aim was to reduce the operating voltage of liquid crystal display so they said why not we make it very highly polar this has got about 9.4 dbs 5cb which is usually used is about 5.3 dbs what they found on cooling was from the isotropic phase three pneumatic phase isotropic 174 very of course you can see structural uh, see this is easy to detect pneumatic phase usual pneumatic phase there was some textural change at 84.5 and in fact in dsc that is differential scanning calorimetry it's very weak transition and then that went to at another pneumatic phase at 68.5 so they called it m1 m2 and m3 they did dielectric measurements and then they found that the mp phase actually exhibited hysteresis polarization polarization was something like 5 micro coulomb per centimeter square let me tell till then even you know the best banana shaped liquid crystal or smectic sea star the highest polarization that they had found was something like 7 600 or 700 nano coulomb per centimeter square this is an order of magnitude high of course 
I think uh, barium titanate is around 30 microcoulomb per centimeter square, so an order of magnitude lower level. But as far as liquid crystal is concerned, there is a very high value. And then they also did SHG, second harmonic generation measurements. Under a field, M1 phase, nothing happened. It's the usual pneumatic with anti parallel near neighbor order. This intermediate phase, it showed some SHG activity at high fields, but the low temperature phase, even in the absence of field, there was a very weak signal, but as soon as they applied a very small field, 0.3 volt per micron, saturate. And they said, this is MP phase, the lowest temperature phase, is ferroelectric-like. This was their 2017 paper. Oh, now I come to the other molecule. Let me show you. This has got NO2 at the end. This was synthesized by a British group. And it's uh, actually called RM734 in the literature. And by the way, this is called DIO. That is because of this dioxane ring. And you find this word DIO in this literature a lot. So it only means compounds with this DIO. Dioxane ring. And this is called RM734 because that is what Mandley who synthesized this compound. That was his catalog number in his uh, lab notes. So that has stuck. RM34. It has a dipole moment of 11 device along the length of the moon. And they found that when you cool from the isotropic phase, there is a pneumatic, isotropic to pneumatic, which went to another pneumatic phase at 132.7, they called it an X, X for unknown. But then subsequently, they did some experiments, Mertley et al. They measured the elastic constant, showed that this play elastic constant decreased sharply as they approached this transition from above. Not the bend elastic constant, play. So then they realized that again, there should be a play modulated structure with anti-ferroelectric order shown like this. This is from their paper. Splayed polarization, but only a width of the order of 10 microns or so. So Dozo had predicted this also in his 2001 paper. If this play goes to zero, this is what you'll get. Later, second harmonic uh, microscopy was used to show that this may be of the order of 5 to 10 microns. Sebastian et al. two years ago. But back to the Boulder group, they synthesized their own RM734, carefully purified. They said there is no splay phase in this. This is actually a truly ferroelectric pneumatic phase. Maybe with anti ferroelectric neighboring domains, but no splay. Because it's the reasoning is simple, splay, that is dive of P, will have a den charge density. Dive P is minus rho, where rho is the charge density. Since the charge density has the same sign everywhere, it's a highly repulsive interaction. So once you have something like 6 microcoulomb per centimeter squared as the polarization, it's impossible to have splay. That was the argument. In fact, this plate structure that I discussed in the banana shape, the maximum polarization was around 200 nanocoulomb per centimeter square. If it was much more than that, it never exhibited this modulated phase because of this reason. In fact, I put up one last term there. Yes, please. Yeah. No, you can finish your sentence. No, finish your sentence, I'll ask you. Okay, so if the polarization is very large, you cannot have spray distortion of the medium. That was their argument. In fact, they did, uh, it's uh, again, uh, you know, about 12 or 13 people in that lot of studies, experimental studies, they said this is only the NF case. And of course, everybody re now remembered that Max Bond had predicted it back in 2016. So they said they have finally found the ferroelectric pneumatic phase. I'll have to. Remark to make about it as I finish my talk later. Anyway. Yeah, I was just trying to understand. So, has the have the sort of long wavelength mechanical properties of 
and NF been worked out completely? And are there long range electrostatic effects which change its elasticity from, from that of an ordinary pneumatic? I mean, in other words, at the frank elasticity level, are there qualitative differences between yeah, NF you see, and as you, you see, in this uh, RM734, the British group did measure the uh, elastic constant. They showed that it did go down as it approached this. But then, when you cross this, the polarization goes so high that it cannot have a split within this. So they said this so-called NX, they called it NX, itself is a split phase. That is what was disputed by the Boulder group. So this play elastic constant does go down in this part of it because as the polarization builds, in fact, there was a model uh, by who is this guy, you know, Selinger and company, who said there is a coupling between flexoelectricity that a spread structure can exhibit and a polarization, which can give rise to this kind of periodic structure. No, so that, is, so that, that would mean that the NF in effect has a sort of singular splay elasticity or? NF. I mean, uh, suppose you had an ideal NF, you know, Paka infinite there NF. There is, uh, as far as I know, uh, in fact, Light scattering measurements have been. That's the only way. Yes, you can that's measure. what. I, so the, that's the only way you can yeah. measure them, right? And the turbidity is unchanged, or is it lower? It is lower. It is, but it is. is it singularly lower? Is it non-turbid, or I mean? Uh, 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 in fact, you know, it will be turbid only if you go beyond 100 microns. Uh huh. Right. Even in an ordinary yeah, event, yeah. five micron displays are no no turbidity. I see. Uh, you see, if the thickness, you see, this again goes as one over a square. Yeah, yeah. So on the D proportional D square, the fluctuation. Yeah, right. No, I'm wondering is it is the long wavelength uh, depolarized light scattering is yes. still one over wave number squared, but the coefficient is different, or is it singularly different from one but over wave number? But I think there squared? was only one measurement, hmm. and they said uh, the display elastic constant here is of the order of uh, 30 to 40 piconewton, uh -huh. whereas in an ordinary pneumatic, it is 3 to 4 piconewton. Right. An order of magnitude larger, but, so, but still fine. they were not sure of the, because right. you see the, you cannot have a, by the way, you cannot have a homeotropic alignment because ah. that produces a fantastic electric field and right. that's unstable. You can only, even if you have a treated your sample for your uh, slides for homeotropic alignment, it always becomes homogeneous. Right. That's plain or Okay, thanks. So there are, uh, in fact, I don't think many studies, physical studies have yet been done. But in the last couple of years, more than 200 new compounds with very small variations of these two basic structures have been synthesized, which exhibit the ferroelectric pneumatic phase. Especially there is a, a Chinese group, is one AYA, A Y A, in uh, somewhere in Beijing. They have synthesized about uh, 50 or 60 compounds in their lab exhibiting the ferroelectric pneumatic phase. And there are some other British groups which have become active. I'll just mention them as Yeah, I'm coming to I'm coming to The obvious question is, what's the molecular origin? Again, now you say, I am personally always interested in this. What the Boulder group did was uh, atomic MD simulations of uh, about 384 RM74. 734 molecules in PT ensemble at a few temperatures. They had both uh, parallel molecules, they imposed parallel molecule, you know, condition, and then also average P equal to zero condition. Then they found, you see, there are good correlations, polar correlations for slightly shifted parallel molecules or chain formed parallel molecules or, or you know, anti-parallel molecules. So these br bright red spots indicate there's a larger correlation. So these three had much larger correlation than other structures. And they left it at that. But there is no simulation studies on DIVA as far as I know. Now, is then many people said, okay, 9 DIVA is what is important. More than 9 dB, you'll get a ferroelectric pneumatic. Is this true? Last Mandley et al. 
synthesized RM734CN, cyano group instead of nitro. That's the only change. The dipole moment will remain intact, 11 device. No ferroelectric pneumatic. Only the higher temperature pneumatic with anti parallel short range arm of molecules. So it looks like, and they synthesize many other compounds. NO2, you find ferroelectric pneumatic. Cyano, no ferroelectric pneumatic. So that is a clue, right? So can we then get some kind of a generic model? To understand this, that was my interest, but of course I. Uh, you see, I, let me make note of a few things. You know, I'm, I should not run out of my time. Only 15 minutes more, not even that. See, each molecule has several electronegative protruding atoms, either oxygen or fluorine. Both are electronegative. Between two such ferro, uh, that is fluorine or oxygen atoms, you have this highly conjugated aromatic core, where the electron is basically delocalized. So very highly polarizing. So if these attract electrons, they have to attract from in the place space in between. So this becomes positively charged. So you have negative charges, positive charges, again negative charges, positive charges. So that gave me a clue. Why not simplify it? Say, I can't do any simulation. I have no capacity. I can always mimic. So I say, OK, I will consider a right circular cylinder. Radius 2 angstrom, length 22 angstrom. Both DIO and RM7734 have 22 angstrom length. I now represent this polar structure by four sinusoidal surface charge density waves. So these are not dipoles, surface charge density waves, but they build the dipole. So you can see that there is a net dipole, but I ensure that there is no net charge in the system. They are not charged rods. Net charge is zero. The wavelength of the waves are equal, L by 4, length by 4. But the, I then realized that it is better to have flexible amplitudes of half waves. I'll come to that presently. So this is the pic cartoon. Uh, this is positive, that is negative, positive, negative, etc. I it's equivalent to some dipole, which is like that. So it's very easy to calculate if now there is a charge on rod number one, rod number two, separated by some R naught and shifted by Z21. It's a very straightforward electrostatic calculation. Trivial. You know, use uh, you sort of uh, integrate over the entire surface of both the things. And so 8 by 8, you will get 64 such calculations for any pair with these geometric parameters. So, you know, Mathematica is very helpful. So you can do it. So I, you see, this is so straightforward, I won't go through this. Now, I take two types, a few different types of waves, all amplitudes equal. I'll get KCA, only two end groups, end half waves have uh, smaller wave, uh, smaller amplitudes. Then apart from that, in C and D, there is one wave with a higher amplitude. The amplitude increases from C to D. So I calculate now for relative shift for a pair of molecules like this. So it is very clear when they are very close, and the positive of one is uh, in the proximity of the negative of the other, the energy is lower. For the anti-parallel case, the two have to be just like that, total uh, registry. But here it should be shifted by half a wave. If, so then for parallel rods, if there is complete registry, it's a highly positive energy. Then, as you shift the second uh, molecule, it goes to a, you know, not uh, such a large positive, but a negative one. The magnitude is smaller, etc. The reverse happens for anti parallel, very large negative energy when there is complete registry, but as you move, it becomes positive, but with uh, much lower. But see what happens in the case B. 
where the only thing I have done is reduce the amplitude of the two end waves, C1 and C8, the first half wave and the last half. Finished. Case B. In the case of parallel rods, they have, you know, the uh, positive energy in zero, that is total uh, registry of the uh, molecules comes down considerably. But then when you shift it by lambda by four, the negative energy decreases. That's a good sign. But even better sign in the anti-parallel case, the negative energy when it was in full registry goes up. That is, uh, I'm sorry, goes down is what I should say. Magnitude reduces. But the, you know, when it, uh, if they um, shift it by lambda by four, you have positive energy that goes up. So both are excellent signs. And in case D, C and D, this is enhanced. But uh, real liquid crystal, of course, has just, do not have just two molecules. You know, each molecule is surrounded by five or six other molecules. So you will have to really consider a group of molecules. And before I do that, let me point out one more thing. If I increase the separation between the molecules or not, you will find that the energy very sharply increases with the separation. The reason is very simple. When they are very close by, they recognize the charge distribution very well. As you move away, it's sort of averaged out, the positive or negative. So it becomes like a large dipole, longish dipole. So it's more like a dipole-dipole interaction. If you even shift it by about 30%. Only when you come very, when the molecules are very close by, it can sense the charge distribution of the other one. So then, in fact, an order of magnitude reduction in the energy. That is the other point. So now, what I do is, therefore, I consider a hexagonal lattice basically made of two layers. These are not layers because there is a relative shift. Of course, if they are all parallel, there are, I consider triplets, one to two, one to three, there are two separation, different separations. But for anti-parallel pairs, of course, there is a frustration. The third one can be either parallel to molecule one or molecule two. And you can, if they are all parallel to only molecule one, you get a ferry electric phase. But I can always reverse it layer by layer, then you can get a totally anti uh, structure and so on. And now I have 19 plus 19, 38 molecules, so 703 such inter-rod, uh, you know, uh, interactions, each with 64 integrations over the charge distribution. So you do all this calculation. Uh, finally, what you find is that if of course, I don't even consider without the end group uh, having smaller amplitude because I know it is only going to give you antiferon. So you don't bother about it. S1, S type 0.4, case B, even in that case, the antiferroelectric structure is favored down to 4.6 angstroms. But in addition to that, if I make S3 equal to S4 equal to 1.15, then as you bring the molecules closer, around 4.9 angstroms, it changes over from antiferroelectric to ferroelectric. And if I increase this from 1.15 to 1.2, the crossover, sorry, here it is 4.6, there it becomes 4.9. So this is the case C and case D. This is the ferroelectric regime, temperature, higher temperature, uh -huh. antiferroelectric. Hello. Uh, I have a question. So in a uh, previous slide, you mentioned that you like uh, S1 and S8 was 0 0.8 and then you... Point uh, 0.4. 0.4, sorry. Mm. And then you changed the other S3 and S4. S3 and S4, uh, amplitude. So. Yeah, amplitude. So what was the reason that you chose those uh, 
particularly to decrease well, and then... I was hoping that without doing it I could get I didn't so okay. I had to change you see if you look at in fact the more sensible answer is if you look at the molecular structures of these two see that was my guiding principle you see here are molecules I know you see only if there is NO2 in fact I should come to that point if I have NO2 NO2 is uh, you know also electronegative, but compared to oxygen, it is electropositive. So, the O2 molecule uh, end groups have now a reduced negative charge because of the nitrogen. If I put a C and that does not happen, so you will never get this reduction in the end charge density. That is, that was the clue to me. That is the only clue to me. Because I know you put CN, you do not get it. You put NO2, you get it. This was found in dozens of compounds, not just one or two. So that was a very clear clue. And then if you have three fluorines, the same story. If you remove the central fluorine, again, there is no anti um, ferroelectric pneumatic. But you replace the central fluorine by a cyano, the ferroelectric pneumatic is retained. But you must have the other two fluorines. So this is very clear clue that the end group should have a lower amplitude. But if you, if you take the amplitude to zero, it does not work. For very clear reasons, you can sit down and you can simply see what are the interactions which will give a reduction in the negative energy of the antiparallel, but an increase in the interaction energy of the parallel cases. I took to them to be 6. In a liquid, it is probably more like 5. But, you know, I have no easy way of calculating that 5. So, if you actually look at the, you see, this is the inverter group. So, you see, here, the net charge is minus 0.62, then plus 61, minus 66, plus 6, minus 0.6, and then it reduces because this is the alkyl end group where the there are no charges at all at the end group. So it, it sort of agrees with this. So I will uh, not go through this. And can I take uh, three or four minutes more? The chairman? I know, I'm sorry. Is it okay? Hmm? Otherwise I can stop here anyway. See, reason you know, last year. 2022, Mandelay did a very beautiful synthesis. Same RM734, but he broke that here. OH group, this is oxygen, he put on a hydrogen, so there's a hydroxyl group. Now this is a pyrimidine ring, there is a nitrogen here. So there is a hydrogen bond formation here, but because the nitrogen is looking in that direction, now the dipole moment of this complex is only 5.7 device. 5 CV is 5.4 device. This is 5.7 device. Otherwise, the external structure is exactly the same. Again, NO2 group. Lo and behold, this goes to the ferroelectric pneumatic phase at 45 degrees centigrade. And so it's very clear. You know, it's not just the dipole moment which is necessary as was argued all along, it is the distribution of charges, a very specific type of distribution of charges that takes you to the ferroelectric pneumatic phase. In fact, uh, you know, subsequently somebody, you know, extended the mayor's of a theory by including this and they refer to my paper to justify this. Uh, even cos theta type of uh, single particle potential and so on. I won't go through any of this. I will just end up with two pictures. These are pictures from, you know, a few months ago, these pictures were published. Look at this, five focal conic domains. You remember what I said yesterday. Friedel understood that smectic liquid crystals had a layered arrangement because of the focal conic texture. But here is a focal conic texture which is got 
using RM734 in the ferroelectric pneumatic phase without any layering of. This is a film of the pneumatic taken on, I think most probably he spread it on uh, what? Glycerin, thin layer. The reason is dive P is not up. Dive P is zero. If Curlin is zero, you get focal conics. Dive P is zero, it means polarization can go only in circles. Only bend distortion is allowed, no splay distortion. But again, I think it's a beautiful picture. It's, I liked it, so I thought I should show it. So you're saying that it's as though layer bend is strongly suppressed in the in in the. Uh, no, in, there is no layering at all here. There is no, no, no. I know. It's, it's it would be as though you had taken a smectic. Yeah, yeah. And said you can't bend the layers. No, no? there you can bend the layers because uh, splay is alone. Bending of layers no, allows no. splay. So, no, no, oh, here, sorry. the polarization, you see, is uh, these arrows like that. The arrows can only have a bend distortion. No splay distortion of P because of the charges. Only right. No, I mean, what you're drawing there is the arrows of the, of the polarization. 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 Yeah, right. So the polarization can only have bend distortion. Right, right. Because that doesn't right. produce charges. So it's as though, this is sort of, the ideal picture here is you sort of set the splay elastic modulus to infinity if you had done that. Basically. It's a little bit like that, Basically. right? Just as Basically. you set the bend, you can think of the spectacle. See, as the Carlin is constant. not allowed there. Here, divergence of P is not. Then uh, DIO, there is an intermediate phase. So again, Boulder Group, they published earlier this year a paper. And what they found in the intermediate phase are these two X-ray scattering, small little dots. Corresponding to something like 18, uh, no, 8 nanometers. They called it Smectic ZA because this is, the picture is somewhat similar to that uh, splay phase that the uh, British group had come up with, except that there is no splay, but they are anti ferroelectric type of order. But the width of each domain is only 8 nanometers. Then they applied this theory, which was apparently that uh, Tanik, Saki, etc. had done it in 1961, where they found a system which went from ferroelectric to anti-ferroelectric uh, phase at a low temperature exhibited this incommensurate anti-ferroelectric phase. In the, uh, uh, the free energy is the usual Landau square quartic and sixth power, you need this because it's a first order transition. The only thing I want to point out is this negative sign. They said this delta Pz by delta V is not display distortion. It is just the reduction in the magnitude of P as you go along an orthogonal direction. And the corresponding elasticity is negative according to this Tanikashi, Tanisaki, sorry, and they Boulder group said this is also true in this case. I'll tell you why. Higher order term, of course, is positive. And then there is a higher derivative, which is also positive. This, they said, is negative because supposing I have small ferroelectric domains growing, the successive things have to be anti ferroelectric domains. Anyway, that is what you find in Smetic ZDA. And they said, therefore, this would be negative. I don't know how good this argument is, but that is the argument. Now, finally, I would just, I think anyway, I've come to the end. I would like to say this is not what Bond said. This is all that I want to say, because Bond, according to Bond, the pneumatic orientational order arose from the dipole-dipole interaction. P1 cos theta average was not zero in the pneumatic phase, according to Bond. In these cases, you form the pneumatic because of the dispersion interaction. There is a high temperature pneumatic phase usually. Some cases, there is an isotropic to ferroelectric pneumatic. But only in a few very special cases with a very specific charge distribution, you can go to this at a high enough density. So this is not what Bond predicted. But anyway, ferroelectric pneumatic, yes. Thank you. Sorry for uh, 
over shooting the time thank you professor for the wonderful talk and i think uh, we have time for a couple of quick questions maybe so professor madhusudan you showed us some very nice 2d periodic structures uh, right uh, with the bent core yeah. molecules so i was wondering if it is uh, even possible to extend that periodicity in the third dimension no, it, these are three dimensions so they can these oh, are this is all so these can these be used for photonic crystal sorry i can, should have made that okay clear. i thought it was all these three. are only cross sections oh, these true. are three, three dimensional okay so these can be used so as this a photonic band gap materials and yeah except that the periodicity is pretty sensitive to temperature so it's okay. not uh, that simple okay and you also told us about switching of the chirality by the electric yeah uh, that is i think they also there are some photo switchable uh, yeah, liquid crystals yeah, yeah. also so in fact people have been trying yes. to see if they can couple these two right where the molecule rotates therefore the chirality is yes. switched yes couple it can one. happen both ways depending yeah. on the wavelength yeah, of the yeah. so in fact that, that's why it's an interesting mm -hmm. observation by this bowdo anyone else okay uh, if if not then uh, uh we'll go to the coffee break and we'll uh, come back at 4:00 uh, the next time okay. so